Yeah. Mystified sigh. Uh, yeah. Do you guys? Um, You're open to other names as well. Like... Yeah, we just can't use demystifying <laughs> science. It's, it's been stripped from us. It has been. And, and let's talk about this. So you guys got a whole bunch of really great. I watched the most recent one too with these two economics guys that that should have won the Nobel Prize for economics, but they <laughs> give it to the one percent, uh, the people who defend the one percent instead. That was epic. Yeah, those guys are badass. Yeah, those dudes are absolutely incredible. I mean, and, and, and you know what? Like, if if we ever like do create free energy or anti gravity, and the and the you know Sweden calls me in the in the middle of the night to tell me I won that prize, I'm going to tell him to shove it up Henry Kissinger's ass. <laughs> you win one as well, or is that or is that just uh, do you just not like Kissinger? Oh yeah, well he 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 won as well. He won the Nobel Peace Prize. So wow. like basically, yeah, if if, if he can win the, the Peace Nobel Prize, Prize and things like these these one percenter economists are winning the, these uh the, this these prizes like uh, yeah i'm all set with that with what with, with that prize and whatever it means it doesn't mean anything to me um i mean what's really cool about mike hudson is he's he's gone back into like deep ancient history and looked at the successful economies and looked at what people did in order to not you know drive their populations into privation and strip yeah it's the... just crazy what's going on right now but these guys nailed it they hit it they hit it so hard um they hit they hit the nail on the head uh, like with that explanation man they explained so many of these terms like uh i i don't even know i have to write them all down in vocabulary it sounds like something you, you should teach to every high school student in america and have them like write these vocabulary terms down and take a I test like most it. people just don't understand how much un un unearned income contributes to the main market this gdp business that everybody talks about the economy the economy is doing great the gdp is up but it's like it's yeah. really just this financial sector siphoning off all the wealth from the normal people and they count that as growth economically but it's really driving us into privation like it's really really hurting but you can't see that in this marker and right so and it's really it easily tactic bidenomics yeah, yeah, it's old. On. This is old, way older than than. Uh, I know it's older than that. It's old. Almost. Oh no. Um, but that was great. Uh, when did you guys switch over? Because I remember I did an interview with you a long time ago, and you were using the uh, Muppets. Right. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking that I was like, her voice sounds so much like her. Yeah. It must be. Yes. Uh, yes. It was, yeah, it was too hard to make. Like we couldn't make eye contact with people. It was really hard to connect. And uh, we were not puppeteers. I think that that was. Yeah, the we had homemade puppets. And... I thought you guys did great. <laughs> I really. It also hurt. That. I like remember. Hell. I remember we talked to you, didn't we? Like we had like a whole thing. You like showed us around your lab and all the the like alchemical stuff you were trying to do. With yes, ma'am. Very true. That yeah, yeah. I was with you. I do. Recall, it was good. Good to see you guys again, and looking very professional, by the way. <laughs> I wish I had a tie. More human, this. at least. Yes. It was oh, the, good. When was that? Alien when was scientists that? that were alien puppets, correct? Two years. Yeah, I think ago. there's still a few videos on this. This is a brand new channel, actually. Well, not brand new, but new since then. I think we have a couple of those puppeting videos at the beginning. Of this oh yeah, channel. Mickey and Quinn. That was yeah, it. There it is. There it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, that's why you got to have content. What happened to the old channel? You didn't have the continuity. You got just got to keep one channel and just got to get plug away at it and keep away at it. You know what? I took a huge break in like 2014 and I didn't do any videos for like a, a while. And, and uh, that was like the, the time of massive growth for YouTube. And, I, and I'm like, man, I'd be like one of the huge channels now if I like didn't go away for those key years. And I just stuck with it. But you oh, came was, back once they were shadow banned or, or uh, shadow banning. And well. they like really abridged access to a lot of topics. And I was looking at, I was looking through your videos and I was like, man, I wonder if you made those videos today. I bet that YouTube just wouldn't feed them to anyone. Yeah. They don't like it. A lot of them are hard to find. You won't, you'll, you won't find them in the searches. Like you can search the, the exact name and all the titles and it will still be on like, you'll have to go to page 100 to find it it shows like it, it, they really messed with the algorithm and stuff and and broken a lot of the smaller channels and uh and whatnot but this is uh 
yeah, this is just a treasure trove of, of great, uh, great guests and stuff. And I do like the more professional podcast, although that was fun with the, uh, the, the, the aliens. It's definitely, uh, it's definitely, yeah, easier to connect with you guys as humans. They just uh, gave it a weird vibe because everybody thought it was a children's show. And so we'd have these people that were working on really complex science and they would show up and they would think that they were having like PBS story time or Sesame Street or something. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair that, that's, yeah. I, so I think it was hardest on the guests and it was very difficult to try to find new guests and try to break their hearts with the fact that we were going to be puppets and it just wasn't worth it and i just remember pierre marie who's basically our science dad at this point uh sat us down we we had him on for i think eight hours and we talked to him and he told us everything about solar physics and then afterwards he called us and he was like you have to stop the puppets <laughs> Like you can't keep doing this. Yeah. You're like, if you were deformed, I could understand, but you guys aren't deformed. It's You're good looking guys. people, right? Like, yeah. yeah. No. I've got another name though for your podcast. If you do want to change it, you could say the science between two ferns. <laughs> Are these ferns? I guess so. Palms, mm. technically, we actually debated for a long time if we should do the palms are. because they were so, it, it could be seen as derivative. But they were the only plants available at home. I do love that show, though, for what it's worth. <laughs> sure, yeah. We cannot rival it. We actually, uh, we, we have to. On a science science. What was that? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's funny because it, it, maybe we thought about calling our show Science Dicks because we just bring on uh, physicists and pick on them or something. I guess that would be closer to Between Two Ferns. Yeah, it's like it's Sesame Street for physics yeah. <laughs> but aggressive yes aggressive just... sesame street physics well, Salva salvatore <laughs> wants to start uh, what we dubbed mixed uh, mental arts mma physics right yeah, so probably. that would be a good good podcast as well um i since i showed you guys around my lab before uh i want to just give you a little bit of alchemical discoveries i've but since made with uh, my monoatomic gold that's white, when I put it out in the sun, it now turned purple. Mm. And uh, I found also that while making monoatomic gold with a pure 24 karat gold anode, pure 24 karat cathode, that it'll make the white monoatomic during the day when the sun is out. But as soon as the sun set, it starts putting black goo out instead of the white monoatomic. And the ancient alchemist tied gold to the sun. So it's like, here it seems to be this physical attribute with it. And then uh, last time, I think I mentioned with the monoatomic silver, it seems that the production rate of it uh, from, you know, pure silver, cathode, pure silver, anode, the amount of monoatomics uh, being produced was tied to the moon cycle. When the moon's waxing and waning, it barely makes any. When the moon is full moon, it makes a bunch. And a couple of times I've had it during a super moon, it literally filled the bucket full of this monoatomic stuff. And I went so far as uh, last year with Jeremy on his alien scientist channel during the eclipse, we did some experiments and I set up the monoatomic silver where before the eclipse, it was moving, making a whole bunch. And then as the eclipse happened, it stopped making any live on your channel. And then it continued once the eclipse was over. So very, very fascinating, these energies and what the ancients tied to it. Yeah, I know gold's a good, uh, monatomic gold's a good absorber in the IR. They, they have to use it to make uh, black bodies if they want to do IR spectrum black bodies. So I wonder if it's something up there in the upper wavelengths that you're seeing in that reaction. Could it be UV? No, that's low, right? That's low wavelength or tiny wavelength. I'm talking about big, long ones. Sure, but like UV would give you a lot of energy because so monatomic substances are like fully dispersed in solution. So you have to break them off the lattice. I was just talking about Pierre was literally just texting me yesterday about how they he was like, there's something really interesting here with with gold, like in terms of it's he, he thinks that it has to do with the protons in the black body contributing to the black body spectrum because you're making these heavy elements are necessary in order to cover the full basis of the of the black body spectrum in the upper wavelengths essentially mm. i don't know it's beyond my pay grade but it's something to consider but like if you're seeing differences in the way that the sun the moon's beyond is, i have no freaking idea that, how that's but about. the moon bounces sunlight it does it, so does, it does wouldn't you expect there to be and the great the strongest component of sunlight is uv isn't it uh is that not right? i don't think so 
No, I'd imagine it's that that the yeah, I would imagine it's less. Really? Right. So demystifying size. I had to bring it up because this is straight mystery. And then you, you know, you bring in the fact that like there's the woman's uh, menstrual cycle tied to the moon. You have any doctor or ER person will tell you that lunatics come out on a full moon <laughs> and that there seems to be these some sort of bigger power energies coming from the celestial bodies somehow. Well, I'm, that's definitely got to be linked. I mean, there's cycles that are happening that are pushing and pulling people around. I wouldn't be surprised, right? Because it's like you're affected electromagnetically and gravitationally by the planets. You know, like one of the smartest physicists I, I, I've talked to um, believe, believes in astrology and i'm like how does this make any sense and but if you think about maybe if like the, the alignment of the planets could uh, could kind of cause uh, certain kind of you know cycles and stuff with uh, right, well from physics point of view they are the largest masses in our physical realm acting on each other with their gravity in the em fields that you know if it's tied to bioenergy somehow that uh, it would make sense i guess does the earth I mean, the problem is that feels... like something even like jupiter like by far the, the most massive body in the solar system like more massive than all the rest of them put together other than the sun but it's you got to think gravity falls off with an inverse square so the effect like if you were standing on the surface well the jupiter doesn't really have a surface but you're standing on the surface of it it'd be like crushing gravity but the effect of that gravity on us here on earth is like I don't want to put a number out, but I think it's something like one sixty thousandth or something. It's like an incredibly low force, basically. Question and, about that: What about the moons of Jupiter? If you're standing on a moon of Jupiter, how much does the gravity of Jupiter affect you from the moon? That's a good question. I mean, they're they're still spherical, right? Like they're not being like totally elongated by it, so it can't be too. Wouldn't much you be in free fall though? Because you're like you know, technically the moon's falling, you know. So it's, I don't know, but it's gonna have. Uh, but it also, you know, like imagine if you had oceans on the moon, would they have tides? Mm. And would those tides be even more like strong? Because I mean, they're affected by Earth the gravity. It's way way I bigger. Will. Is Io Saturn or Jupiter? Yeah, right? I was gonna say Io is kind of. I think that's what Io is all about, right? Because it's yeah. got these all this magma that's getting squished out of it by the tides, right? Exactly. Yeah. Crazy volcanoes and like, I think it's volcanoes are like amplifying the uh, magnetic field. There's like this entirely wild system of feedback going on. If we yeah, Io is very alive. You know, academia to apply some real um, quantum physics to this. Uh, you know, horoscope uh, astrology business will have a Schrodinger's horoscope. Man. Yes. I'm trying uh, to figure out if the if there's any effect of the lunar cycle or the solar cycle on the Schumann resonance, or on the Earth's magnetic field, because those are probably the only two ways that I can imagine there being something that's transduced. Because I know that um, we had this lady on the show who was talking about quantum biology. And she was talking about this guy who builds really good Faraday cages. And he has a lab in France. And he's discovered that if you put tadpoles inside of a Faraday cage that cancels the Earth's magnetic field, they develop weirdly. They're, they're mutated. Hmm. So you have to have the proper magnetic field in order for the embryos to be able to actually move into the right position and to actually form the tadpoles without their heads and stuff being in the wrong place. And so if that kind of a small absence or presence is necessary, then you can imagine that a small variation in just ambient conditions would generate. I can imagine all the stars. The also, I can imagine all the planets affect the sun in some way too. Not, not good on the Wi-Fi. Uh, uh, uh. All right. <laughs> no, he, was, he was asking like, if that's the case, how's Wi-Fi affecting us? And I was like, not good. Uh, uh, yeah. What were you trying to say? Though? I was just saying that I could imagine I can imagine the resonance of the planets, like the alignment of the planets affecting the sun, in particular, its magnetic field. And so the solar wind and so all the downstream effects of that on our, our own lives here. I don't know. I'm always looking for this. It's funny because like I teach this uh I teach this basic intro astronomy class at the university, and the textbook uses astrology as this like, you know, demon of anti-science. Uh, and it's really interesting to go through that with people because, you know. 
a lot of people believe in more people i would say believe in astrology than believe in science it's like a really popular thing especially in the throughout history but, hmm. uh, but it's like you can i well i've experienced this where i can like pick up these random astrology books that were written like 50 years before i was born and it's like you flip to like your exact date and stuff and like the whole alignment it's like how the heck is this thing defining me and then it's like it becomes pretty hard to not believe in it in some way when the majority of the time they seem accurate i guess like one of the other punching bags is that the astrology calendars were set up two thousand years ago or three thousand mm -hmm. four thousand years ago and so the stars are actually like the pole star for instance has moved a little bit so all the stars are like not quite right uh just due to the precession of, of the earth and so you're not really in the astrological sign that your chart says that you're, you're in. in the wrong house yeah something like that well, they're written to be sufficiently generic that they apply, right? It's like, this is how mediums... I, Jeremy, what, did yeah, you, what is the thing that you're showing? Oh, I don't know. It's, I, I found a Schumann resonance generator on eBay. Oh. This looks <laughs> yeah, that's what the Schumann antenna looks like. That's the geometry of it. And then you see some of these ancient drawings that literally look like they have these Schumann generators on them. It's crazy. And then they're built into floors, the mosaics of floors and lots of cathedrals as well. Oh, man, when you were talking about the gold, I was thinking about the cap on the Egyptian pyramids, too. We had this uh, we had this dude that uh, pre he presented this really out there theory, but and it sounded like almost too out there for us to even entertain. But it, it turned out to be really compelling that there was this industrial chemistry going on inside of the uh, pyramid, that I'm the structure of the chambers was basically... Uh, basically more appropriate to industrial chemical manufacture than anything else and uh, they were basically doing the haber bosch process of making ammonium fertilizer and all of the downstream chemicals that and he goes through it and he's like they've literally never found a body inside the great pyramid he's like that's not a sarcophagus that's a vat for chemicals <laughs> but it's like it was such a compelling presentation actually that's one of the podcasts uh, i don't know what number it is but you guys should check it out uh, Jer what was his name Jeremy? Yeah, let's, we should look it up uh, it was really funny because shiloh booked this and he tells me as we're going into it, he's like, hey, we have this guy who's uh, studying the pyramids and about how they were producing massive quantities of industrial chemicals in the pyramids. And I was like, are you fu are you fucking kidding me? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like this is un interesting because then like, I remember I read one of the books I read a long time ago is uh, Christopher Dunn, the Giza power plant. And we uh, have him coming like next week. Oh, I just oh, remember this guy's channel. It's called uh, Land of Chem. Check Land it out on Chem, YouTube. Yeah. yeah, Land of Chem. Yeah, he wouldn't do my podcast. I, I don't know what's going on with that. He, oh. but, uh, yeah, Christopher that, Dunn. He did. Uh, he did. Um, he went on Danny Jones recently, and mm. uh, so yeah, he had this whole theory in his book that there's uh, the Queen's Chamber was like they took like grape juice and and uh, something else, and it ferment, you know, turned into hydrogen gas, and that the hydrogen gas would rise up into the King's Chamber. And that the king's chamber had this resonance hall of the Helmholtz uh, resonators inside the, the grand gallery right here um, that would create these microwaves or sound waves that would vibrate in inside a resonance chamber inside the king's tomb. And that this resonance um, of the hydrogen gas inside that chamber would was somehow a fusion reactor. But then I don't know how they get the power out or wh where it went the from arc, there. The missing arc that fits perfectly into the box in the king's chamber. And I've been talking about this, that Egypt, because originally it was Chem, the land of Chem. They right. renamed it. And it's like Egypt. They've been gypped out of the energy. It was stolen by Akhenaten or Moses when he took the arc from it which fit in and was the giant capacitor box and john hutchinson has made the replication of it in japan i think it was like 10 20 years ago and like they were getting mad power out of this arc that they uh replicated interesting i mean That's god knows good. how old that thing is right it's like how do you even date a bunch of rock what's what's the stand does anybody know the standard way that they give the the pyramids their date oh they, they find wood 
They find wood. They find wood that's like buried in the the pyramids. Themselves. From their construction. Well, they date it by the kings that they claim or the pharaohs they claim that were buried in it, right? Ah, uh, there's a king list, but in addition to the king list, they also have radiocarbon dated wood that they believe was used as scaffolding in the construction. Mm. And so somebody made the really good point the other day, where they 